Good morning. You awake now? Good morning. Are you ready? Some of you look ready. Some of you look like you're not quite sure. It's a difficult topic. Forgiveness. Part two. So open your Bibles to Romans, where we just were. So last week we raised more questions than we answered, and we'll probably do the same today because life is nothing but a stream of learning if we're paying attention. Romans 12, verse 14. Actually, we're going to start in 10. Verse 10. Still hear pages turning. I'll let you get there. Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with an honor giving an honor giving preference to one another. What does that mean? What does it mean to give preference to someone else? This idea is at the root of forgiveness. When someone does us wrong, does it feel good? It does not feel good. And so at that point, moment in time and the time that follows, we have a choice. We can hold on to the pain that they caused and keep punishing them for it. But if we choose that way, what are we saying? Who's more important, us or them? You know, it's strange, but the deeper I go into God's Word and the longer I spend with Him, the more I realize how we talk about following Jesus, but how little we actually do it. So, for example, I got a text message this morning from a young person, not in this church, but an Adventist. I'm sitting in church, and people are talking about how living a life in Christ, consists of praying and reading your Bible. But I think it's more than that. And I'd like to take action one day. And she goes on. So the church says it's praying and reading your Bible. She says, I think it's more than that. Well, where would we go to find the answer? Is it what the church says? Or is it what she thinks? We would follow Jesus. Now, did Jesus only spend time in prayer and reading the Bible? Is that all he did? Guess what? If that's all he had ever done when he was here, you wouldn't have any idea who he was. Not a thing would have been written about him. So she's right. But she's not right because she thinks she's right. She's right because she's starting to read her Bible and get to know Jesus and realizing, hey, wait a minute. It's not just spending time with Jesus and reading your Bible and praying. It's actually taking action. Okay, I'm, we're going to finish reading Romans this section. I'll try not to interrupt myself anymore. And then we're going to ask ourselves a question. So we're in verse 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints. Look, there's action. 
Given to hospitality, more action. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is, feed him. If he or she is thirsty, give him or her a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his or her head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Question. Would you say that it's easy to live this way, hard to live this way, or impossible to live this way? If you love Jesus, it should be easy. Okay? Okay, so getting along with others is not always possible, but the, but the resistance should be on their side, not on our side. Okay? Loving our enemies, blessing those who persecute us, easy, hard, or impossible? You don't want to answer. Let me tell you something. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So that's out. It's a hard one, isn't it? Is it hard or is it impossible? Move the cups around. What'd you say, Debbie? What comes before that? She just said, with God all things are possible, but there's something that comes before that in that verse. With man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So if you're finding it impossible, the problem is not that you're not doing the right thing. The problem is that you're not with Jesus. Because with Jesus, all things are possible. So if Jesus is our example when it comes to forgiveness, then we should probably look at what he did. Wouldn't that make sense? So let me tell you a real life story that happened last week, this past week, in this province, in one of our churches. My colleague got a hold of me and said, what would you do in this situation? And when I read the situation, I thought, I'm glad I'm not in that situation. Thank you for not putting me in that situation. So the church is renovating their basement. Part of that renovation is putting in a new kitchen. They hired a contractor. The job is well past the halfway point, but the cabinets are not yet in. One of the elders of the church came to the board meeting, or whatever, committee, building committee meeting, I think it was. And he said, I've been at Ikea. They have cabinets that are cheaper than the cabinets that we picked out, and I can put them in myself. We can save a whole bunch of money. And the building committee said, well, we've, we're, we've already hired these guys. It's already in process. Like, it's, let it go. It's over. And he slammed his fist on the table, and he cursed, and he swore, and he threw his chair over, and he left the room. Never came back. Elder of the church. 
So thank you, Trudy and Kip and Terry Lynn and Karen. Work. What would Jesus do? That's the question my colleague my, has to answer. What would Jesus do? I can tell you what I've seen happen, and you've seen it happen. You may even have lived it. There's a few things that might happen. One is it'll be uncomfortable for a while, but nobody will say anything. But everybody's going to remember, and it's never going to get ever actually resolved. That's usually what happens. Or somebody else who saw it happen or heard about it could get all high and mighty and say, we've got to do something to this guy. And it could go that way. But what would Jesus do? That's the only question that matters. It doesn't matter what the church manual says. It doesn't matter what tradition says. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what Jesus would do. Because we are followers of Jesus. And if we're actually not going to follow Jesus, we would do him a service by stop saying that we're followers of Jesus and just go somewhere else. Because we're not doing him any favors when we do what we want and say it's what Jesus wants. We're not doing him a favor and we're not doing ourselves a favor and we're not doing anyone around us a favor. So the very first story in the Bible when things go wrong is where? In the garden. Jesus gave them everything they could ever possibly want. They weren't lacking anything. But he said, there's one tree that you just trust me. It's a bad idea. Putting your hand on that hot burner, son, that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. What'd they do? They tried it. What did Jesus do? Fast forward 4,000 years. Jesus is here as one of us. Knows what it's like to be cold, knows what it's like to be hungry, knows what it's like to be betrayed, knows what it's like to be misunderstood, knows what it's like to be lonely. He knows everything what it's like to be us. He invests the last three and a half years of his life into 12 men. Teaches them everything that God has taught him does everything he can to get them ready for when he's going to leave. Explicitly tells them, we're going to talk about that this week on Thursday night, Friday night, and on Sabbath. It's not just going to be a historical lesson of the death of Jesus. If you think, I'm not going to come, I've heard that a thousand times, it's actually going to be prophetic too. We're going to learn what Jesus' death actually means for the future. In a simple way. So if you think that it's too high for your friends to come because they won't understand, it's going to be simple but deep. So Jesus is here. He's invested. He's invested. He's invested. And he tells them point blank, I'm going to go to Jerusalem now. He hadn't been there for months because they were always trying to kill him. I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to... I'm going to die. He didn't just tell them he was going to die. He told them who was going to be responsible for his death. The leaders, the chief priests, they're going to send me to the Romans and I'm going to... I'm going to die. So it wasn't like they didn't know. And yet when the crunch came and he was in the process of dying, people started looking around at the crowd and pointed at Peter and said, Hey, you. You're with him. You're one of his. Oh no. No, no, not me. Unless we get all high and mighty and think that elder down in that other place that isn't here who did that thing this week and cursed and swore and ran out of thing, think he's a horrible person. Peter cursed and swore and threw the chair over and said, I'm not with him. I don't know him. Well, what would Jesus do? We don't have to wonder what Jesus would do. Because we know what he did. 
said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Did Adam and Eve really understand what they were doing when they took that fruit? Peter didn't even understand really why Jesus was here. Didn't understand why he was dying. Didn't really understand any of it yet. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You say, well, what does that look like? Priest on forgiveness here last year. I don't know if you remember. I was going to give you a quiz, but I thought that was mean since it was a year ago. But one of the things we talked about was consistently through the Bible, we are shown by God that the one who is in the right is to make the first move towards the one who is in the wrong. That doesn't make sense to us. In fact, when my colleague, there's a group of us that pastors in Alberta, and we have a little discussion group that we talk that nobody else can read or see, and we, whatever. So when he told us this story, he, he gave options. He actually polled us. What would you do? And he had three or four options. One of the options was, would you demand that he ask for forgiveness? Find me somewhere in here where God demanded that we ask him for forgiveness. He invites us to ask for forgiveness. But he makes the, the first move. You know, those of you who are old enough to remember, and it may start again here with Putin, uh, what, what's going on, I don't know what he's up to, but it may start again. But for many years, between the U.S. and the Russia, there was a war. What did they call that war? The Cold War. The Cold war. Many of you have lived the Cold War in your bedroom. I'm not talking to her. Till she talks to me. I'm not talking to him till he talks to me. The silent treatment. That'll teach him. But what would Jesus do? <clears throat> so while Adam and Eve are huddled in shame and hiding because of what they did, Jesus comes. Where are you? Why did he do that? He had all kinds of options. Just going to hit the delete button and say, well, that experiment didn't work. Let's start over. Why did he do that? Why would he hang on a cross dying? And the only people that he invested everything in cursed and swore and said, nope, we're not with him. And he says, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Gene, you said it would be easy if we loved Jesus. I'm going to modify your statement. I think you'll agree with me. It would be easier if we loved Jesus. But I don't think that when Jesus was in Gethsemane and on the cross, it was easy. I don't think it was easy for him to watch the two people that he had created with his own hands huddling in fear, running from him. I don't think that was easy. Doing the right thing rarely is easy. I hope you're still open in Romans. <coughs> Romans 20, 4, 12, sorry, verse 20, the chapter we've been in. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, 
give him a drink. Now, if we take away those literal statements about food and drink and just look at the principle of what's being said, what is Jesus saying? If you find any opportunity, any, to demonstrate that your heart is still for them, take it. And then he makes this strange statement. For in so doing, you will heap coals of... What does that mean? Does it mean show him how good you are and embarrass him? Shame him into correcting himself. Be so good that they'll, they'll just crumble and they'll feel they have to be nice to you whether they want to or not. Is that what he's saying? Do you know what Jesus did after the cross? He could have just sent a message and said, Hey, if you're sorry now, you've thought about what you've done, I'm here. You can come and see me. Is that what he did? What did the disciples do after the cross? First thing they did. They ran and hid. What did they do after that? Even after they knew he was alive, what did they do? They went back to their old life. Clearly, I've made a mistake from which there is no return. So I'm just going to go back to the behind-the-scenes guy I was before all this started, pretend it never happened, and hopefully Jesus can find somebody else to do better than I did. I don't know how many times I've had people come to me in the 20 years of my ministry and say, Pastor, I just, I'm not qualified for that anymore based on X, Y, Z. And every time I think to myself, have you read the story? Because I don't know what you did, and even if I know what you did, it doesn't match what Peter did. They're gone fishing. They're gone back to their old life. They've given up on them. That's why the ones who are in the right have to go after the ones who are in the wrong, because nine times out of ten, they'll give up on themselves. You think they're evil for what they did. They think they're hopeless for what they did. So Jesus comes to the beach. He makes breakfast for them. He invites them to come and eat with him. And gently lets them know, I'm still for you, not against you. And I still want you to continue on the journey that I set you on three and a half years ago. This isn't over. So this crazy thing, in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Does anyone here have any idea what that means? We're Seventh-day Adventists. We should know the answer. We should know where the coals come from. Is that a hint enough? Come on, what's one of our messages? The sanctuary message. You come into the courtyard, you offer your lamb, the priest takes the blood into the sanctuary. In there there's a table of showbread. There's a lampstand, the bread of life, and the light of the world, and in front of those, on the way into the most holy place, is a little altar. The altar of incense. Isaiah was a priest in the sanctuary. Thought he was a pretty good Christian, good Seventh-day Adventist, knew the 28 fundamentals. 
And then one day he's in the sanctuary and he gets a clear vision of the holiness of God. You know, it's easy to feel like you're a good person if you compare yourself to the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world. But when you see God, it's a whole other story. And he says, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and an unclean heart. It says an angel takes a coal from off the, touches his, says now you can go. How will people know how to forgive unless first they are forgiven? Think about that. The Bible says very simply, we love God because He first loved us. He didn't send a memo. He came. He said, I'm going to live the same filth that you live. But I'm going to show you there's a better way to handle it. There's a better way. Easy way? better way. The easy way is better now. Makes a bigger mess later. The hard way is hard now. Much better later. God is inviting us to do for others what He has done for us. Do you see it now? I'm sitting in church and they say that being a good Adventist is reading your Bible and praying. That doesn't make sense to me. There has to be some, some action. Sometimes I wonder if our young people are leaving the church because they don't believe or they're leaving the church because they're bored to tears. Because we talk and we talk and we talk. And young people want action. But then Jesus taps us on the shoulder and says, you want action? Call Jimmy. Tell him what he did to you. It hurt, but it's okay. You love him. Invite him out for supper. Take Susie out for a meal and tell her you value her more than the pain that was caused you. Oh, Jesus, I don't want that much action. I'll just go back to reading my Bible and pray that you fix the situation. When Peter fell on his face and cursed his own Lord and Savior, Jesus did not send a note. He didn't send him a Bible verse. He didn't just pray for him. He prayed and then he came off out of the tomb and he went and found him and said, Peter, it's not too late for you. I'm going to end with a heavy statement. I'm going to sit down. I found for most Seventh-day Adventists, the problem is they don't actually fully believe that they are forgiven because we know too much about what's right and what's wrong. And we're looking at the list instead of looking at the Savior. There is no Bible hero outside of Jesus who didn't do something stupid or heinous. And God didn't give up on any one of them. Nor has he given up on you. So when you figure that out, go tell somebody else that you haven't given up on them either.